Well, good morning, family. Good morning. It is good to be with y'all. Listen, I haven't been in the pool pit in two weeks. One of those weeks was not my own choice, but God is faithful, and it's so good to be back with y'all. If I haven't met you yet, my name is Pastor Jerry Wilson. Everybody calls me J. Will, and I get the privilege of being the planting pastor of this young church. We are seeking to be a place of refuge that just call all to Jesus, connect to a greater family, and live commissioned as kingdom citizens. And today we'll be continuing our time as we look through the Gospel of Luke in our sermon series, Meals with Jesus. It's a unique feature that you see in the Gospel of Luke that Jesus is either going to a table or he's leaving a table. But Jesus spends a lot of time around the table. So we want to spend a little bit of time looking at many of the meals that's in this Gospel. And today we find ourselves in an interesting uh interesting part of the text, our interesting meal, which is actually one of the few meals that's mentioned across all four Gospels, the feeding of the 5,000. The reason this is so interesting is because uh, both skeptics and, uh, and those who may not believe the faith but want this form of Christ, they all point to this story. And as we dive into it, we'll see how this story is more this is less about the meal itself, but a reminder, a reminder that Christ is faithful. Our sermon today is called A Faithful Reminder. Pa- family, I have a confession. I'm forgetful. I, I forget things all the time. I walk in the rooms. I don't know if y'all have ever had the experience, but I forget why I went into the room. I for, yeah, see, I knew you was going to say something. I forget <laughs> names. I, I forget my telephone number. Listen, sometimes I forget my very age. I, they'd be like, how old are you? I'm th-, and I start doing the calculation. I forget. I struggle with forgiveness. And as y'all can hear, it drives my wife pretty crazy. Uh, she says it's because I'm getting old, but I just think it's because I got a lot on my mind. You know, on top of all of those things, as bad as those things can be, though they're far shadowed by something even worse. I realize how forgetful I am about the faithfulness of God. I'm prone to forget how he brought, what he brought me through. I'm prone to overlook what he hand, what his, how his hands are actively at work in my life. And sometimes I forget that he knows what he's doing and that his plans are better and more satisfying than mine. I'm forgetful. I know it. I know I am. But family, I'm thinking if you can be honest with me today. You're pretty forgetful too. You, you, you are a pretty forgetful bunch, and I'm not picking at you. I'm joining in with you. You see, we're all leaky faucets behind the great walls of our life that is continuously dripping and forgetting the greatness of God, the faithfulness of God. But Justin, I'm not picking at you. I know what happened, but you listen. <laughs> We're forgetful. Life mounts up. Life comes, and we forget how we got here. So what do we do? What do forgetful people do who have forgotten about the faithfulness of God? Well, praise God, as forgetful as we are, he has given us words to remind us of his truth. He has given us stories of his truth. And this today, this, uh, we get a glimpse at his faithfulness. And we're going to see an interesting thing taking place. We're going to see disciples who have just forgotten his faithfulness. How Christ brings them to a place where they're desperate to remind them that he is faithful. And then at the end, we're going to see how he faithfully satisfies. If you, matter of fact, put this in one sentence. He has been faithful. Jesus is faithful, and he faithfully satisfies. We can go home right now. That's the whole sermon if you want it in a nutshell. (laughs) He has been faithful. This is actually how our text starts off. We join in to the story because we see the apostles have returned, and they reported all that Jesus has done in verse 10. 
So as they return and they report all that they have done to Jesus, he takes them and withdraws them to a, a privately to a town called Bethsaida. And when the crowds followed, they follow, when they found him, they followed him. He welcomed them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who needed. Now, what did the apostles just return from doing? Well, if you go back a few verses, in the beginning of chapter 9, verse 1 through 3, we see that he summoned the apostles, he gave them power and authority over all the demons to heal diseases, then he sent them out to proclaim the kingdom of God, to heal the sick. Take, and he told them, take nothing for the road. He told them, no staff, no traveling, no traveling bag, no bread, no money, and don't take any extra shirt. He had just sent the apostles on a mission and said, remember that I am faithful. Remember, I'm with you. I'm, I'm doing something. I will show you. And as they return, they're reminded he has been faithful, just like he said he would be. Family, if you were to look back over your life, where have you seen Jesus show he is faithful? He has truly been there supplying all of your needs. While I was studying this week, I was just, it's almost like as I was reflecting on the text, I was reflecting on my own life and I just had story after story after story show up. I'll tell you about a quick testimony. In 2019, I was starting as a church planting resident at Riverside before we planted. It's about November. I can remember the date because it was one of the hardest seasons I had been through at that point as a resident. Why? The money was starting to act funny. I, I, this is my first time ever fundraising. This is my first time ever getting money, I mean, having to go ask churches and people for money to help me do this residency and to push into ministry. And Landon Jones, who was the executive pastor at the time, he sat me down. He said, listen, you got enough in the account for two more paychecks. After this, if we don't figure out how to find the funds, we ain't going to let you starve, but we're going to have to have some conversations. The stress that hit me. I left job to pursue this. I I told everybody the Lord was going to do it. I had my, my, when I left my last job before becoming a resident, they said, you show? I was like, God's got it. And here I am, November 2019, like, Lord, do you have it? <laughs> I don't know what to do. So I started making phone calls, making emails. Nobody was like, it's the end of the year. Nobody's cutting checks at the end of the year often. There ain't many people signing up to help. Then uh, I got asked, not me go find, I got asked to come sit in at a meeting at a church to tell them the vision that I had. And it was funny because it was me and another church planner. They asked us. We didn't call them. They came looking for us. Do y'all understand? Christ says he takes care of his people for real. <laughs> I sat down. And they said, what do you need? I'm shaking, sweating, just, you know, just, just, just terrified, just clenched up. I was like, I want y'all to pray and consider, uh, what does it look like for y'all to give $20,000 to a church plant residency and potential uh, line up with uh, our church for 1000 a month? And they said, oh, that's it? Wait a minute. <laughs> I had never experienced something that made me, my mouth drop. That's it? You see, the Lord had a plan, and he knew what he was going to do as I was going. He said, just trust me. I called you. He has been faithful, family, and I need you to know he has been faithful in your life. The fingerprints of God should hopefully be all over your life. But he is not a God that just did something in the past, but he also wants to show you he's still very active in the present. He is still very active right now. See, and this is how we know he's very active. Look at verses 12 through 14 with me. So you remember, we took him to Bethsaida. He's healing people. He's taking care of their needs. He's doing all these things. And then 
Late in the day, the twelve approached and said to him, send the crowds away so that they can go into the surrounding villages and courtsides to find food and lodging because we are in a deserted place here. Now, pause right there. I want to give you some context. Bethsaida was a very interesting city. It actually sits on the coast of the waters. In John chapter 1, verse 44, we find out this is the hometown of Philip, Simon Peter, and Andrew. And they were fishing. That was the family business. Matter of fact, the name Bethsaida in Greek literally means the house of fish. This was a place of plenty. But Christ didn't take them to near the water. We see he took them to a deserted place. If anybody know what is there and available, it should be Andrew, Philip, and Simon Peter. They grew up here. So they know where we at right now. It ain't possible for us to get food here. Send them back home. Send them back to the city. Let them help go find lodging. You know, that's a good travel. More than likely, that was for probably about a five to six hour travel to even get back home. This is where Jesus takes them. And when he takes them there, he tells them, he says, you give them something. Again, I just gave you context. Wait a minute. They know ain't nothing here to give. So they told him, look, this is all we got. We, brought, we, we packed enough. We packed the day lunch. We packed, we packed the lunch box that was going to bring us here until we get to the next town. We have no more than five loaves and two fish, they said. Unless we go and buy food for all of them. And another text that says that's about 350 denarii. That's a year's worth of money. I don't know how we're going to get all this. And it was about 5,000 men were there. If you, a note from Matthew Matthew chapter 14, verse 21. He says, those who ate were about 5,000 men besides the women and children. So we know about the 5,000 men that was present. We don't know about the women and children that was present. So it could have been fifteen to 20,000 people. Jesus led them into an impossible situation and said, let's make something out of it. Wait a minute. You know where we at, Right? Family, I want to let you know, Jesus will lead you to places where it seems impossible so he can show you he is all that we need, that he is faithful. Do you know there are seasons and places where the Lord will lead you to places where there's nothing you can do but put your trust in him for provision? And when you do that, he said, that's all I need you to do. Trust that I'm faithful. Uh, I grew up, I, 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 I was going back and forth about this. I grew up playing spades. I don't know how many played spades in this house, but I grew up playing spades. Um, in chocolate households, let me tell you, spades is a real thing. It's a real thing. You, loot, you get in fights over spades. You know, I still got people picking at me from a spade game from 10 years ago. Spades is a serious ordeal in a chocolate household. <laughs> now, here's a... Here's an interesting rule, and I'm going to teach you some rules about spades, even though I'm a, I ain't going to teach you how to play spades. If you don't understand that joke, ask some of your black friends that, that play spades how often they teach others how to play spades. We don't do it. You better sit at the family house, at the family table, and that's where you're going to learn it. But in spades, if you don't have a spade in your hand, you get to throw your hand back in and get a redeal. But if you got one spade, you got to play that hand. It don't matter how good or bad that spade is. You got one of them. You got to play that the hand. Oftentimes, our lives look like a hand that's full of a, bad, a bunch of bad cards, but we got to play it because we got that one spade. And in spades, you got to tell your partner how much you got. You know, if you, if you, again, if you ever sit around spades, they say, how many books you can get? And hopefully you can get one. The lowest the team can get is four. If they get four, that's bored. That means, all right, we're going to walk. It wasn't a good hand, but it was, a, it was enough to get us through. But see, Jesus will put us in a situation where it's like, I got a possible. I ain't got nothing. I got a possible. But the highest hand a person can get is 10. And Jesus will look across at us and say, we're going 10. Wait a minute. 
Now, y'all don't understand the math of spades. <laughs> you can only get 14 books. 14 books is the whole game, which means somebody got to get three and be what they call set, meaning that, that, that's how they, they done lost that hand. For, and for the other person to get 10. I just told you, we get dealt hands where we got none. Maybe the possible. When Jesus is on our side, he shows us, I got it. I, I got it. I can, I can imagine it now. Sitting at the table, I throw out the heart, the heart of 10. The enemy done hit it with an ace. Ah, that's gone. And I'm looking at Jesus like, all right, now that, that's a book we lost. I throw out a I throw out a, a, nine, a nine club, and then we get it with a king. Lord, he made that king walk. That's gone. Throw out that one spade, hoping that's going to win something. And we just knock that out. That's gone. All right, I don't know what we're going to do now. But then the Lord looks up, and he laughs. And, and again, y'all, if y'all want to get some entertainment, look up spade games on YouTube. That's all I'm going to say. Spade game, they be putting the card on their forehead, be like, that's what I got right there. Boom. They, they, that's an ace. That's an ace. That's a joker. That's a deuce. They just throwing spade hands, and they just throwing cards. See, the Lord will put us in situations. Our hands look real bad. Real shabby. But it's because he wants us to trust him. Okay, if that's too much of a secular example for you, let me give you some biblical examples. In Exodus, he took the Israelites into the wilderness in the desert, and in Exodus chapter 16, he provided manna and quail from heaven. In 1 Kings chapter 17, he sent uh, the prophet into the house of a widow who had enough flour just to get through one more meal. He said, before you make that meal... Trust the Lord, make me a meal. And he let the oil and flour continuously be multiplied. And then in, cha- in 2 Kings chapter 4, verse 42 through 44, he had, this, this prophet had 10 loaves of bread and it was 100 men. And the Lord said, feed them. And he multiplied it and made it happen. Family, why do I tell you? Because even when we don't know it, the Lord is still faithful. Even when we don't know what we're going to do, when we seek him, he cares for us deeply. This is why our heart posture should be like the psalmist. Psalm 42, verse 1 through 5. As a deer longs for flowing water. Oh, I long for you, God. I thirst for God, the living God. When I come and appear before God, my tears have been my food day and night. While all day long people say, where's your God? I remember this. As I pour out my heart, how I walk with many, leading the festival procession to the house of God with joyful and thankful hearts. David's like, I remember those days when you showed up and when your goodness and grace would be here. So why is my soul so rejected? So dejected? Why are you in such turmoil? Hear this charge that David says in verse 5 of that song. Put your hope in God. For I will still praise him, my Savior and my God. David's like, in every season of life, even when it seems like everything is stacked against me, put your faith in God. Praise God. He is our Savior and our God. And in the wilderness with these men, after they had just seen how God had been faithful as he sent them out, he's now saying, I'm still the same God here right now. It's a reoccurring theme in the Bible. It says he is, he was, he is, and he is to come. And I want to let you know he was, is, and is to come. He was good and faithful to you. He is good and faithful to you, despite what you might feel right now, where you might be right now. He is good to you, and he is to show up and come. But what happens when he comes? Look at verses 14 through 17 with me. He told his disciples, have them sit down in groups about 50 each. They did what he said, had them all sit down. Then he took the five loaves and two fish, and looking up to heaven, he blessed and broke them. He kept giving them to the disciples to set them before the crowd, and everyone ate 
and was filled. He is faithful to satisfy. I love the fact that he put them in groups because he needs to show you. I'm going to put you around some other hungry people who need to be satisfied, who need to be taken care of. I'm going to put you in groups with other people so that they could testify of his faithfulness and how they've been satisfied. And now as you long and wait to be satisfied, you got other people you could talk to. Family, this is actually why we have put the discipleship groups out there. Yes, we want you to get your reps in, read the Bible together, eat together, pray together, figure out how to serve one another. But it's so that you can have other people that testify about the goodness of the Lord with you. Those days when it feels like life is pressing down, you need somebody who can come and lift you up and says, look at him, he is still faithful. Those days when you feel like everything is falling apart, you need someone to come alongside you and say, I understand, I feel you, and it is right for you to feel these feelings. Your heart feels dejected, but oh, my soul. He is satisfied. Put your hope in God, for I still praise him. Everyone that day ate and was filled. Do you believe that he will satisfy you? Just truthfully. Do you, do you believe that he truly will offer exactly what you need in the seasons when you need it? Oh man, I love the Lord's prayer. It says, let thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day. <laughs> Our daily bread. Which means the day we get there, he know exactly what we need when we get there so that he can take care of us while we're there. He, but sometimes, I mean, he got to put us in some rough spots. Everyone ate and was filled. But he wasn't just talking about the crowd. Ate and was filled. It says they picked up 12 baskets of leftovers. That means even the disciples, the apostles who walked with Jesus at this moment, who doubted Jesus, he said, I'm going to take care of them, and I'm going to take care of you too. Family, sometimes it feels like everybody around you gets taken care of except you. But he's a God whose grace satisfied not just a few people, but all those who trust and put their hope in him, all those who look to him. And he gave the revelation of why this is so important. In John chapter 6, verse 35, he says, because I am the bread of life. And Jesus told them, no one who comes to me will ever be hungry. No one who believes in me will ever be thirsty again. Oh, family. I need you to leave this place today. I know some of us might have came in weary, drained. I can tell you right now, in this season of life, I needed to be reminded of this as I reflected that he is the bread of life. He is faithful. He has been faithful. He is present. He truly satisfies. How do I know that he can truly satisfy? How do I know that he is the bread of life and that anyone who comes to him hunger, hungry will never hunger again? Because the biggest thing we needed to be satisfied was the very wrath of God, and now that is not on our life. Oh, as the singer sings in Christ alone, who took on flesh, fullness of God and helpless babe, the gift of love and righteousness, scorned by the ones he came to save Till on the cross, as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied for every sin on him was laid here in death of Christ. I live. We can put our confidence and trust in the fact that we will be satisfied because he has satisfied our deepest desire. And that is the satisfaction of our sin being taken away. On the day he died on the cross, <clears throat> for him, for a moment, it was the end of life. For us, in that moment, it was the beginning of life. On the day he went in the grave, after he died, his last breath on the cross, he went in the grave, left death and sin and shame in the grave, and came out and <gasps> breathed anew. He says, everyone who trusts in me, you now breathe anew. Oh, I gave them a little bit of a meal, but the one who sat in the table before us welcomes us to a great banquet of life, of righteousness, of hope. 
This meal perplexed so many people because they're like, okay, so Jesus is like, he just throwing big fish fries. But it's because they missed the bigger purpose. This meal says nothing in this world can satisfy you, but I can satisfy you with little. I can satisfy you. I will take care of you. I will give you more than you can ever imagine or think. I will pour out more grace. And you think I got to figure out how to fix it. And he's like, I'll take care of it. But put your trust in me. That's the purpose of this meal. And as we share our meals, this is why we come together. To tell each other about the one who satisfies us. This meal is temporary that we experience here, but the meal that we are going to is an eternal meal. So I want to give you this faithful reminder. He has been faithful. And today, and forevermore, he is faithful. And those who trust in him, he faithfully satisfies. So my question is, do you trust him? Do you trust him? him? Do you see his hands of faithfulness from past? Do you see how he is being faithful in the present? Do you know that he is preparing you to be fully satisfied for all of eternity and you get to get glimpses of it right now? For the believer who believes that they've been satisfied, this is your time to invite more to the table to eat. Tell the testimonies of his faithfulness to you. Tell him how he's being faithful to you and invite them to come and be satisfied by him. But for those who have not put their trust in the Lord today, those who cannot look back and see how he has been present, how he is present, well, today is your day to come and be satisfied so you can see the fingerprints of Christ all over the life that he has given you. Will you come? Will you reflect? Will you be reminded? Will you pray with me? Oh, Father, I just, the, the reminder of the, sing, of the song that says, we are satisfied in you. Oh, Lord, help us to be a satisfied people, not being, looking around for more satisfaction, looking to other means to care for us. Help us to be satisfied in you. Lord, I pray today that as we've heard your word, that you would help us to reflect and be reminded of your faithfulness, that how you have been with us since the beginning, and how you say you will never leave us nor forsake us, and you are leading us to the day when our hope will become sight. I do pray for those who may be here today who don't know that you are the God who satisfies, that takes care of them. I pray that you will reveal your grace to them, that you will reveal your ways to them, that they would know that in you is the fullness of life and the fullness of satisfaction. Lord, help today be their day one, the day they have the newness of life in you. And as those who have been reminded that we have new life in you, Lord, help us to sing praises to you, lift them high to you, and rejoice for what you have already done. So be here with us and join into our singing, O Savior. We ask all these things in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Would you please stand and continue to sing with us?